Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is uh, our flagship energy show, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And my co-host today, as before, Jeff Ono. Hi, Jeff. Good afternoon, Jay. Jeff is a lawyer. He uh, was, for a long time, uh, the consumer advocate of the state of Hawaii. Did a fabulous job there. Now he's with Watanabe Inc., which is a very notable law firm down the street. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we are happy to have him here with us. Thanks, Jay. So uh, let's, let's talk about the show today first. Um, this is going to be a, a discussion of the global energy perspective and its impact on Hawaii. And we have David Isaac on the line, and we we'll hope to have Mark Glick here too. Um, but before we get into that, we always have our Hawaii energy uh, uh, introductory piece. Okay, and we have today Ramsey Brown, who's one of the regulars at Hawaii Energy and who was right. excellent in presenting some of their programs. <laughs> and the program we're talking about today is ADU. Welcome to the show, Ramsey. Thank you, Jay. Tell us about it. Yeah, nice to be here. So the ADU, the Accessory Dwelling Unit, is part of the mayor and specifically the city and county of Honolulu's plan for more affordable rental housing. Um, and Maui is actually already ahead of this. They have about 29% of lots on Maui that can have an ADU uh, have an ADU, and uh, less than 1% here on Oahu. And so what am I talking about? An ADU is an accessory unit placed on your uh, homeowner's lot. Uh, so if you have less than 5,000 square foot lot, you can have up to 400 square feet of accessory dwelling unit living space. And greater than 5,000 square feet, you can have an 800 square foot, so up to 800 square foot accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and a lot of times this is good for, for students and young couples. This is also good for kupuna aging in place. Um, and we have a video to show you exactly yeah, kind of yeah. what the layout could look like. Of Let's take a look and we get a better handle on ADUs and what we can do for them. Mm -hmm. for the people who are born and raised here so they don't have to leave. Certainly, a government has to be very assertive and aggressive in dealing with this. But today with this ADU, uh, this is an opportunity where local families, local homeowners and landowners can get involved and at a cost-effective way build one of these, rent it out, and possibly even earn some income. I think it's really you know, kind of fitting that we have this ADU on state property here at the Capitol grounds and we have our state legislature here. Because we don't tackle affordable housing unless it's part of a partnership between the city and the state. And this is an example of that, teaming up with the private sector. The ADU program holds much promise. Clearly more needs to be done. And the city needs to explore ways in which we can improve and strengthen the program. And in that regard, I look forward to working together with Hawaii Appleseed Center Habitat for Humanity and other affordable advocates. One. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Ramsey uh, Brown, and he's going to tell us what we just saw. How about an interpretational discussion? Sure. So that was Habitat for Humanity's Build-A-Thon for 2017, and they decided to partner with Hawaii Appleseed, uh, and they, they created this accessory dwelling unit um, kind of for show there on the corner of Baratania and Richard Street so that to raise awareness, they've had a hundred people an hour uh, coming through this ADU, wow. picking up forms, learning more about some of the waived fees that Department of Planning and Permitting has promoted uh, to get more of these built, um, over $10,000 worth of fees that will help home homeowners now make the decision to dive in and build an accessory dwelling unit. So that's where Hawaii Energy comes in because we know that as you build more on your property and expand, your electric bill is going to go up. 
So why not get out in front of this and in the design phase work in some energy efficient appliances, some LED lighting. Um, so we created this, this pledge form. Uh, I'll show you here. Yeah, please, I'll show yeah. the camera. Okay, pledge form. Um, pledge form. You can download it online. I'll leave some here with Jay at ThinkTech. And uh, basically it says that as I design my ADU, I'm gonna, I pledge to install energy efficient appliances uh, and lighting and that sort of thing. Um, and if you send us back one of these pledges, then we'll gladly mail you a $60 valued uh, home energy kit absolutely free. That's great. You know, <clears throat> it's, like, it's like this makes you friendly with the government. <laughs> <laughs> Were we unfriendly with the government? No, I'm no. just saying that. <laughs> anyway, uh, cross-examination, Jeff? I think it's a worthy cause. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful program. Yes. Thank I hope you. you can expand it to a lot of, you know, ADUs. I mean, what, what do you expect will happen? You know, I don't know. Um, we're hoping that this will help to curb some of the housing crisis that we see here on Honolulu, especially, uh, and we'll be glad to get uh, out in front. Like I said, this is a new construction project, and it, it's it's fun for us to be able to dabble in in the what ifs as people design their new homes uh, as we continue to help and retrofit people's existing homes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it goes with the proposition, and I'm sure you've seen this as as the uh, consumer advocate. Incentives change conduct. Hmm. This is an incentive. Hopefully, it will change conduct in the right direction. Ramsey, you're terrific. Brian, did you know that? Brian, okay, aloha. Did you know that Ramsey's terrific? Will you, will you come back soon? Certainly. Thanks. We'll take a break. We'll come back with uh, David Isaac and hopefully Mark Glick. <laughs> hey, Stan the Energy Man here. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, and I invite you to join me every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii at 12 o'clock, where I give you all the energy news that's worth talking about here in Honolulu. And uh, I love to talk about hydrogen. So. Join us on Friday on my lunch hour here at ThinkTech Hawaii. Be there alone. Hi, uh, this is uh, Jane Sugimura, and I'm the co-host for Condo Insider. And uh, we're on ThinkTech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we talk about uh, condominium living and issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And uh, so I hope you will join us every week at on Thursday. Uh, and uh, we appreciate... Uh, you uh, viewing our show. Aloha. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host on Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Aloha. This is Reg Baker, host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 and highlight successful stories about businesses and individuals in Hawaii. We learn their secrets to success, and it's a show just packed full of information. Hope to see you at our next show. Aloha. Aloha. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Uh, come and join us every Friday at 4 o'clock uh, on Perspectives of Global Justice. Okay, we're back. We're live. Jeff Ono and me. He's uh, my co-host. He's an attorney with Watanabe Ng down the block, and he's the former consumer advocate of Hawaii, and he's going to be able to ask some good questions here. We're going to start uh, talking with David Isaac now. Welcome to the show, David. Ah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we see you there. And, um, you know, we want to get a handle on what's happening with global energy, because, you know, we haven't, we haven't talked to you or, or Sasha Fisheraki in a while. Uh, we need to get a handle on um, you know, where it's going, what are the factors, what are the influences, what are the prospects for the price of oil, the availability of oil, and LNG, okay? Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, there's, there's a lot of oil around right now. There, you know, there's too much of it. Uh, obviously, a lot of the things Saudi Arabia did were designed to shut down as much oil production in the U.S. as possible, but it hasn't been all that effective. So, we're looking at at a fair amount of oil for for quite some time to come. That doesn't mean it's always going to be cheap. It will go up and down. That's what oil does. But but it's there for at least 10 to 15 years. Now, LNG's oversupplied. Mm. So LNG prices are collapsing. People are trying to make all kinds of deals. A lot of the big projects that were planned have been shut down even though they're partially built. 
So LNG is going to be cheap for quite some time to come. And in fact, uh, some of the people in the LNG business are talking about offering fixed prices, which is, that's been unheard of in the LNG business. Taking the risk of the market. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, they're desperate. Yeah. They got to sell it. They have the investment in the infrastructure. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And they need, they need to claw back some money somehow. So I mean, what effect is the Trump administration having on all this? Uh, I, I suppose uh, um, they're, they favor fossil fuel and uh, they're trying to take the stops out on it and make it even cheaper and put more investment in too, I guess. Yeah, but the crazy thing about that is, is that they have all these theories that we can produce more of everything. And <laughs> you don't really need more coal if you're producing more gas, and you don't really need more gas if you're producing more oil. They're, 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 you can't pursue all those goals at once. Yeah. So it's, it's more smoke than, than fossil fuel, if yeah, you will. Yeah, coal smoke, specifically. So <laughs> what about coal? Where, where does coal fit in the picture of these three? I, th I think coal's in big trouble, no matter what they do. I mean, we, d we don't need it. We're already sending a lot of our coal overseas to, to other people. And, and it wasn't really the environmental legislation that pushed coal out of the picture. It's, it's the big wave of cheap gas that we've had from, from all the domestic production. Yeah, what about the, uh, the role of, uh, you know, um, workplace danger and all that in the, in the coal mines? I always thought that was a pretty uh, dangerous job to have. Uh, well, it is. Is, that, is that affecting, uh, you know, the development of coal mines? Well, you know, more and more, I mean, the really big sources of coal are all mined above ground in places like Wyoming with I mean, open, huge open machinery. Pit, yeah. yeah. There is, you know, back east, there are still some, some underground mines, but even that's being automated a lot. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this, a lot of this concept that it's all been shut down because of government policy, the jobs are just disappearing on their own. Yeah. Well, I guess the question now is to drill down and, and, and find out what you mean when you say that it's going to go up and down. I love that. You, know, you ask a guy about the stock market and he says, oh, it's going to go up and down. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about the uh, oil market and the LNG? We, we, you, you told us about LNG, and I would like to hear more about exactly how high and how low we can expect it to go, not necessarily in, you know, in 10 or 15 years, but in five years. What can we expect? And uh, then we'll hope to, hopefully we'll ask Mark Lick. Uh, how we compensate for that and plan against that uh, here in the Hawaii energy market. But what are your thoughts more specifically about how high and how low it's going to go on, on all of these counts? Well, in, in the case of oil, we're expecting it to bang around someplace between 40 to $60. It could go as low as 35 occasionally. It could mm -hmm. go up above. It, 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 de it depends, obviously, on on the market and how panicked people get about things. A uh, war in the Middle East could make a difference. But if you look at what's been going on for the last few years, you had Libya go completely belly up, and it didn't affect anything. So yeah. there's a lot of oil out there chasing buyers these diverse, days. Diverse sources are good. Jeff, what do you got on this? Well, a couple of things, David. Um, can you bring this, you know, home locally to us? You know, what, what effect has uh, the low price of oil had on, on our refineries? Are there profit margins greater because of it? And is that going to extend the life of the refineries so that uh, we're not likely to see them shut down in 2020 as predicted by the, the uh, refinery task force? Well, I don't, I mean, basically with renewables coming in and fairly effective conservation programs in Hawaii, we just don't need two refineries. We, it's, it's at least one too many. The refinery task force might be right that both of them are going to shut down. Mm -hmm. But the, the big, with the exception of, of, of the mainland U.S., the new sources of oil that we're seeing tend to be traditional heavy, high sulfur crudes. And Hawaii can't work with those. Hawaii has to have low sulfur crudes to make low sulfur fuel oil and to make the other products that we need because the, the refining system isn't very sophisticated. It's not a high-tech business. It was high-tech in the 1970s, but it's, it's an old-fashioned kind of refining industry now. So, two, things, two things come out of that for me. One is, uh, does, doesn't two of any company make for competition? And are there benefits to have two and that competition? 
or are you saying that we could do with one and it would not affect the price? Well, to tell the truth, uh, you don't get too much competition to begin with because because they control the import infrastructure. <laughs> right. So they're dealing with the same import cost. Yeah, and 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 there's no other way for for anybody else to get to get product into the state. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. so there's. If that's for us, excuse me, just a on? second. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff, what's what's your reaction on this so far? <laughs> Is David okay. back? Yeah, David, are you there? Yeah. Okay, we're we're hang loose around here. <laughs> you get what you pay for, Jeff. <laughs> so the the other thing Sorry. is, uh, you know, the logical possibility, and I we were talking about this before the show, um, that you know there will be a, a run on oil at some point, and maybe maybe a shrinkage uh, because of the Middle East and otherwise of uh, source. Also, you mentioned that we need LSO for low, low sulfur for all of our generating systems here in Hawaii. And um, I mean, petroleum generating systems. And, yeah. <clears throat> and that, that means we only have a subset of the world market. We are, we are dependent on LSO. And, and that means that if LSO shrinks at the source, we're going to be paying more uh, for a limited piece of that pie. So oh, yeah. oh, I'm yeah. asking you, you know, are, are we going to have, a, a, you know, the, the old uh, drama of having the price go away sky high again? Oh, yeah. You can expect the prices in Hawaii to be much, much higher in the future just because of the requirements for LSFO. The, the volumes, the number of crudes that are accessible from Hawaii that are low sulfur is just a tiny handful of 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 crudes, mostly in Indonesia, uh, a little bit in Malaysia, basically Southeast Asia, and they're very expensive. The other thing that's going to happen in the next couple of years, the, the, the fuel oil we use in Hawaii is 0.5% sulfur, half a percent. So that's really sweet and clean by world terms. Mm -hmm. But what happens in 20? 2020 is the International Maritime Organization is making all bunker fuels for all ships worldwide a maximum of 0.5. And so suddenly, they're going from 3.5% down to 0.5%. Suddenly, we're going to be competing with all of the ships all over the world. Millions and millions of barrels of, of new demand for low sulfur material. And we're not sure how that's going to play out in the shipping industry. Nobody knows where it's all going to come from. A lot of people may start burning diesel instead of, instead of fuel oil in ships. But whatever happens with that, it is going to drive up the price of the exact kind of fuel that the power industry in Hawaii uses. Any chance that rule could be changed if times get uh, tough, if the price goes too high? I don't think so. It's already done deal, huh? Yeah, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Everybody's everybody's rolled it in. You know, everybody's arguing about what it means. Yeah. But but and for a while they said, well, we're going to institute this in 2020, but we're going to go we might go to 2025. Last year they said, nope, it's going to be 2020. Who's they? Uh, the International Maritime Organization. Mm, okay. And ev everybody is actually bound by their rules. Well, David, I wanted to ask a little more about, you know, importing uh, refined product, refined petroleum products to Hawaii. Um, uh -huh. You know, do you think we're ready to do that? You know, can we have the Aloha Terminal? We have the two single point moorings that are owned by the refineries. Um, do we have the necessary infrastructure to import refined product when, when that time comes and the, the two refineries shut down? Oh, sure. Sure. It, it, it requires... Doing it efficiently would require a little bit of work, but uh, but yeah, we could turn things into an import terminal fairly rapidly. What do you need That's for not, an import terminal? You basically just need a good, clean products line and and uh, and places to park your ship. So, is this come in by tank on the ship, or does it come in barrels, or what? No, it would come in come in on ships, and and actually, a lot of our jet fuel already comes in on ships. It's not all made in Hawaii. And a lot of material is actually leaving Hawaii. If you look at the situation PAR Petroleum is in these days, they're buying, because they lost the HECO contract for fuel oil, 
they're buying the cheapest crude they can find, which is high sulfur material, and exporting all of their high sulfur fuel oil. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, you're dragging, you're dragging crude from Alaska or Mexico or parts of the United States to Honolulu. You're refining the crude, then you're having to sell the the fuel oil you're producing off in Asia. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of a sketchy proposition economically, but the, they're making it work because they're buying such cheap crudes. But it's it's not how anyone would design something. <laughs> what do you say we move to the second part of our discussion? Uh, <laughs> well, before we do that, can I ask one other question? Sure. I want to ask about uh, petrolithium extraction, David. Um, oh, it's something uh-huh. it's something new, but you know, and uh, you know, it, it's a way to, to extract lithium from the the wastewater that's coming out of the, the uh, um, some of these uh, uh, petroleum oil wells, and um, you know what, what, what's the technology there? Is it commercially viable, and is it going to change uh, the battery industry? Pepso, petrol lithium, uh, lithium extraction. <laughs> My wife and I at dinner speak of little else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's kind of an obscure technology. I don't think anybody knows what the costs are going to be. And, and whether it will be competitive, but I, I suspect it will be because you're dealing with a substance, you know, this brine has got to be disposed of somehow. And so they're talking about cleaning up the brine. Lots of people would support that. Places like Oklahoma, where they're doing a lot of fracking and you need to re-inject it into the groundwater. If you were injecting clean water instead, it, that would have a direct benefit. So, I, But it costs I think money, it, doesn't it? It does cost money. But it costs money to mine lithium, too. We might be looking at a situation here kind of like the situation with sulfur in oil. Um, you know, if you go back 50 years, there were lots and lots of sulfur mines around the world. I don't think there's a single one operating anymore because they've started extracting sulfur from oil mm-hmm. because of environmental cleanup reasons. So now refineries have big piles, big yellow piles of sulfur outside them. They just load it on ships and send it off. It's That's great. It's the industry out of business. Yeah, lucky to live in the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, Jeff? Now okay. we're fine. All right. So now, with that behind us, oh, um, I, and I, Mark Lick is not here. Can I'd I like add to just po- one other thing? Oh, on, sure. On okay, sure. Issue? <laughs> sure. Well, you were, you were asking about the, the lithium, uh, lithium for batteries. Have you been following any of the developments from the guy who invented the lithium-ion battery? I know they're improving. Well, he, he's called, his name is John Goodenough, and he's actually working on solid-state batteries. He claims the lithium-ion battery is outdated and will never really do what we need it to do. What's so a solid-state battery? It's, most of them are a version of some kind of uh, glass-like material that can maintain a charge. Mm-hmm. It's a very... It's very recent concept, but it's kind of like a thumb drive or a flash drive on, <laughs> on your computer. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's got no moving parts. Uh, it doesn't catch on fire <laughs> like lithium-ion batteries. And it, it can charge really, really fast. Now, nobody knows what the costs are, but he seems pretty convinced that we're going to have a battery breakthrough in the next five to ten years. And talk about a game-changer. Yeah. How does that differ, or maybe it's close or the same as, as graphene? Well, some people are talking about about using, you know, buckyballs and graphenes and things like that for for solid state batteries. So, it's when you say solid state, there's a there's a large number of materials out there that might be used. But you know, ultimately, our our energy problem is really an energy storage problem. Yeah. There's lots of energy. You bet. We just came in back fact, uh, on Friday in from fact, the Tesla facility yeah. in Kauai. That was a statement of it. In fact, you know, I mean, one of the reasons oil is so popular is because it's stored energy. It's solar energy, in fact, just <laughs> from a few hundred million years ago. Yeah. Unfortunately, you, you can't recreate it or put the energy back in. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the can, benefit of a battery. You, you can, but you have to be really patient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> And thank you for the, the you know the the, uh, the the talk about the solid state batteries. That sounds very, very promising. So we only have a minute left, a couple of minutes maybe. 
and I wanted to ask you what you think Hawaii can do to deal with, you know, the uncertainties in the market uh, for oil, for LSO, for LNG, and I suppose for coal. Uh, we do use a little of that uh, out at, what is it, AFP? AES. 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 Yeah. yeah. So and, uh, what, what do you think we can do? Give us some planning points. Well, I guess the the big choice that needs to be made at some soon, <laughs> preferably soon, is the choice between LNG versus versus oil. That's you know, there large volumes of LNG are needed for it to be economic. You can't bring it in in barrels. And that's incompatible with running the power system on oil. So so that's that's the crossroads that we're at. Um, didn't the governor say he didn't want to do LNG? I'm trying to remember that. He was pretty definite about that, yes. <laughs> well, he, he said for electricity generation is, is my recollection. So the, the, you know, it leaves open the possibility that marine transportation, motor transportation, uh, you know, that might still be open for LNG. Mm -hmm. We're just about out of time, guys. Um, sorry about that. Wish we had six hours more <laughs> to conduct this properly. But Jeff, can you, as a, as a co-host, summarize what we've learned today and where we're going on this? Well, what I've been hearing is that you know uh, oil prices are are unpredictable. But uh, David, Dr. Isaac, you know he's saying oil is going to hover around forty to sixty dollars a barrel, and I think you know that's still low oil. Yeah. So you know we we have opportunities here where, when oil prices are low to make investments in our electric electric utilities grid um, and, you know, modernize that grid and, and keep uh, electricity prices down. Yeah, gives us a breather and maybe yeah. more capital to spend on developing clean energy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Uh, lovely to have you with us. I hope we can have you on again soon. Talk okay. more about this going forward. Uh, and thank Thanks you, Jeff. Guys. Thank you for being co-host. Thank you for coming down and organizing the show with Sharon Moriwaki, who's sitting there in the bleachers. Ooh, hi, Sharon. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> watching. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, a product essentially of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. We'll see you next week. Same time, same station. Thanks. <laughs>